Hello, and thank you for having me along to Current Archaeology Live. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be talking to you today about archaeology uh, and the National Trust, and specifically, as we've all been spending so much time at home recently, the archaeology of home. Um, I'm particularly delighted to be one of three uh, National Trust uh, colleagues joining uh, Current Archaeology over the weekend to talk about projects that are underway. So I do hope that you are able to also catch uh, Anna Forrest talking about uh, Oxborough Hall and also uh, my colleague from the Southwest, Martin Papworth, who will be talking to you about Chedworth. And both Martin and Anna's uh, talks provide a useful way of introducing uh, some of the topics that I'm hoping to cover in my short talk today, which is about um, both artifacts that are found underneath uh, floorboards in houses and also artifacts um, recorded during excavation which help us to understand more about the use of spaces, the development of spaces and also the decorative elements that go towards making up uh, those spaces. So without further ado um, I would like to talk about underfloor uh, archaeology and we're starting with a quote here from one of my colleagues in the trust, um, Mark Newman, um, where he says, a National Trust archaeologist is almost as likely to be found unpeeling and recording layers of wallpaper or plaster as they are layers of soil, or to be researching World War II radar stations rather than Roman villas. And we have a long and, and quite proud history of searching under the floorboards. So that, as I mentioned, is where I would like to start my talk today. So we're beginning, um, looking under the floorboards uh, at Knoll in Kent. So one of the biggest projects that the National Trust has undertaken over the last uh, sort of 10 years or so, which was the Inspired by Knoll project, a, a 20 million pound heritage lottery funded project, which uh, had a whole range of different aspects to it archeologically, but particularly included work to um, the interior of the property and the showrooms, um, and some new spaces that were opened as part of the property, part of the project, particularly uh, within the attics. So here we see an aerial view of Knoll in Kent, one of the largest uh, country houses in the UK. And we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the finds from under the floorboards that were recovered um, by our uh, archeology span volunteer team at Knoll and also by members of Museum of London Archeology. span So we're starting right at the front of the building uh, with the outer wicket, which you can see at the center of the West Range there in the image. Now, this was a, a lived space during the 20th century. It was occupied by uh, Eddie Sackville West, who was a member of the family and who lived in rooms above the main entrance to Knoll. And from the floorboards in those spaces, which were also later occupied by one of the estate managers, Mr. Mason, we found a whole range of personal items um, that just give us a little glimpse into how people were uh, spending their time in those spaces. So we've got things like uh, shaving uh, accoutrements, razors and so on. We've got buttons, we've got change that's been lost under the floor, we've got nail files and matches, and we've got possibly a, a dry cleaning ticket or something on the left hand side there. And it's those personal items that really give us a, um, an insight into the, the lives of those who were living uh, in Knoll during the 19th and 20th century. So this is another a group of artifacts. These also found in, in attic spaces, but these are from the Eastern Front. Uh, so spaces that were occupied by um, servants. And you can see here some of the artifacts retrieved from under the floorboards in those spaces. So we have uh, not just any uh, cold cream lid here. We have a superior cold cream. We have again, buttons and beads and uh, coins. That's actually an Irish coin in the top picture and very personal items like hairpins as well coming from under the floorboards in those spaces. From the gardens outside at Knoll as well, artifacts have been uh, retrieved and one of the most uh, commonly attested occupations or activities rather at Knoll uh, is smoking. So here you can see a Turk's head a 19th century clay pipe recovered from one of the gardens on the north uh, side of the complex by um, Bridget and Hugh Sackville West, so members of the family uh, occupying Knoll. And again, from within the attic spaces, uh, a really fine um, 18th century clay pipe and uh, deliberately deposited, we think, um, under a small flight of stairs, a short flight of stairs in the Eastern attics. And this idea of deliberate deposition as well as accidental loss is one that we'll return to 
throughout this presentation. So as I said, we found a lot of evidence for people smoking uh, at Knoll, everything from uh, World War I period cigarette papers that you can see at the top of the screen there, uh, 1960s and 1950s cigarette packets, sometimes left with a, with a date and a name uh, on them. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the, the bunny ashtray, so something that might have been an animal feeding bowl in its first incarnation has been recycled uh, as an ashtray found uh, again in all of these are roof space uh, or under floorboard finds. And we get an, an indication of some of the activities that might have been taking place uh, in those roof spaces. So potentially items that have been left not only by the family, not only by the, um, the occupants at Knoll, but also by people who were working at Knoll, um, potentially visiting as working as workmen or um, maybe living on the property themselves. So this is from the kitchen uh, Ruth Space, and as you can see, is an uncensored uh, biography of Marilyn Run Monroe, which clearly someone finished reading while they were working uh, up in the space and then left uh, for us to find in the future. One of our most um, spectacular finds at Knoll is this uh, 17th century letter. Uh, so it's from a gentleman called Robert Draper to his, his dear friend, Mr. Bilby and is uh, almost like a, a wish list of items to be sent from one place uh, to another, including new frying pans, lights for my lady Cranfield's chamber, uh, and fire guards and shovels. So various of domestic items that would have been moving between uh, one property and another. Now we think this doesn't relate directly to Knoll, but has come to Knoll as a later um, sort of part of the collections and is um, part of the correspondence that we know was stored again in the attic spaces, this time in the South Barracks, and has fallen out uh, of the trunk in which it was stored at some point and become lodged under the floorboards. It um, was found in almost a pile of sweeping, so you have this very vivid uh, idea of someone cleaning up and literally brushing things under the carpet, or in this case brushing things down uh, into a void in the floorboards um, for us to find several hundred years later. So there's all kinds of items that are, are found at Knoll that relate to people's lived experience there. And this is a really lovely one. So this is a, a mid to late 20th century newspaper, um, which has been delivered to Knoll at some point. You can see the name uh, at the top uh, right hand corner there, Mrs. That's from Mrs. Hutchinson, who was one of the housekeepers at Knoll, who was having a, a daily express uh, delivered to her. And um, we found it very close to where the flat was that she actually occupied. And again, sometimes we get little insights into um, what people were eating and drinking uh, at Knoll. So these items were found under the floorboards in a very small intervention in the Reynolds room. Um, and you can see we've got uh, an animal bone of some sort there. We're not sure exactly what kind of bone that is. So uh, any uh, pointers very gratefully received, possibly a kind of bird. But we do also have an oyster shell um, and also a cork. And we know that the Reynolds room was used as a dining space in the past, so these may well be the remnants uh, of a meal. The paper items that you can see on the left-hand side um, of, the, of the image there may represent um, items that were lost by the occupants of the houses or may represent uh, items that have come in with visitors uh, accessing the showroom. So we've got a early 20th century tube ticket um, in the middle of the image there and also a, a very fragmentary remains of what turned out to be a 1970s Greek postage stamp, um, which you can see blown up on the right hand side. So again, indications of items that have traveled quite a long way uh, to come to Knoll. Uh, one of my favorite finds from under the floorboard uh, is this, which is um, a Perrier bottle, as you can see, but it's also um, as I hope you can see, it's a, a message in a bottle. So this is an example of something that has been deliberately left uh, for someone to find uh, in the future as a kind of time capsule. This is again another find from the Eastern Attics and the message within the bottle on the outside, it said, uh, take this out and see inside. So we need no further introduction. Um, and this is what the message actually read. So this bottle was dropped here in the year AD 1906 by S.G. Doggett, when these radiators were put in and also the hot water service. So it's giving us a wonderful insight into uh, working at Knoll in the early years of the 20th century and the kinds of uh, infrastructure that was being installed then. 
And it's also given us an insight into Mr. Doggett himself, who is a, a prolific graffitier and has left his name uh, in a number of places on the walls at Knoll. So we know from his own uh, recording that he worked at Knoll from 1898 until 1960, uh, an incredible uh, work record. He also lived uh, on the estate as well, so he's very much part of the Knoll story. A few metal artifacts here. So these um, are spangles or sequins, which were found under the floorboards of the Spangle bedroom. Um, again, within the East Range, one of the showrooms on the first floor, and they had fallen from the hangings of the spangled bed, uh, which lives in that space. And we collected hundreds of these items with tweezers from under the floorboards and a number were able to be reattached to the bed hangings uh, during the conservation of the, of the bed. So just one final example of a find from Knoll. This is a, a metal artifact and this is a, a jeton or trader's token, an early 17th, late 16th or early 17th century uh, metal token, which was found under the floorboards just at the threshold uh, of the spangled bedroom. It was found in a rat's nest, so it could have been uh, sort of moved around by the rats, or it could have been the remnants of, a, again, some kind of uh, ritual deposition. So leaving a coin under a threshold or under a windowsill is sometimes things that you see um, when you're looking uh, in house spaces like that. Um, or it could have been a casual loss um, that has fallen underneath the floorboards when the room was being refurbished in the early years of the 17th century. So I've been working a lot with my colleagues um, to sort of look at um, archaeology of the uh, sort of underfloors um, across the National Trust estate. So I wanted to carry on uh, through this talk with some examples that uh, my colleagues have provided. Um, so we're moving now to Wiltshire. Uh, to Avery Manor, where Bryony Clifton, working again with a team of volunteers, has been undertaking uh, a investigations under the floorboards there. And just again, a single example um, that Bryony has sent over, um, and it's another uh, Nuremberg jeton, so very, very similar to the example we just looked at uh, at Knoll, very similar in date, and fascinating to see these same kinds of items being uh, sort of found in houses across uh, the country. Um, so we have them known from uh, Kent and we also now have them known from Wiltshire. Another example from the Southwest comes from Nancy Grace um, and her work a number of years ago in 2013 uh, on the Kingston Lacey Estate in Dorset at Walnut Farm. And, and there where the contractors were again working in an attic space, they found an incredible collection of items, um, some of which probably relate to the use of the space. So things like books and pages from newspapers and almanacs and plays. Um, what we're looking at here is probably the remnants of a book cover, um, but also a lot of um, clothing and fabric remains, um, which may have been items that had been originally worn and then had been added into the attic spaces as part of the sort of insulation of that space. So this is a a child's sort of corset or vest um, that you can see in this image here. Moving up uh, to Yorkshire and a project undertaken by Mark Newman at Nunnington Hall, uh, again a number of years ago. Uh, so here you can see the spectacular um, house uh, at Nunnington Hall. And when they worked under the floorboards there, they found an extraordinary uh, range of items um, there. So including items relating uh, to sewing, which is something you may well hear about uh, in Anna's talk on Oxford as well. So in rooms which have good light, um, there, there is good evidence for that kind of occupation happening uh, within these spaces in properties. Um, lots of evidence, lots of really lovely evidence for games. Um, so we can see tally tokens uh, like the little fish on the right hand side, chess pieces, playing cards, again, sort of dating to around the 17th and 18th centuries, um, all coming up from under the floorboards. And then really uh, unusual and spectacular items like this one, um, which you see here Mark holding in the image. This is a, a coded notebook, um, possibly relating to, to Jacobean conspiracy, uh, Jacobite, pardon me, conspiracies, um, and deliberately hidden uh, under the floorboards. Um, so again, as well as accidental loss, 
deliberate deposition of, of things that people are hoping will be found in the future. We also have occasional examples of things that have found their way under the floorboards because people are trying to hide them and they do not want them uh, to be found. Moving uh, to Wales, um, and I'm very grateful to Claudine Gerard and Catherine Campbell uh, from uh, Newton House in Wales, who have been letting me know about some wonderful uh, artifacts, again retrieved from under the floorboards, um, which were actually part of a project that was underway during the 1990s at this um, spectacular 18th century house, um, which has its origins in the, in the 17th century. And from here we start to, uh, as well as all the other amazing things they found, what I've picked out to quickly look at today are some of the items that show us about the decoration of the house uh, during time or over um, a period of time. So this is a fragment of uh, mid 18th century wallpaper um, that has been recovered from uh, again under the floorboards. And this is a, yet another um, part of uh, a wallpaper sample in this case, a mid 19th century wallpaper, but is actually echoing an 18th century design. So we can see this sort of idea of changing fashions and uh, changing rooms, if you like, um, reflected in the underfloor boards finds. So for the last part of this talk, I wanted to move on to looking at um, excavated items um, and maybe the sorts of things that are more traditionally associated with uh, archeological work. So artifacts that are coming from uh, digging uh, and below ground deposits as opposed to below floorboard deposits. Although you could argue that looking below a floorboard is just excavating inside. Um, so it tends to be somewhat warmer and drier unless you're doing it in the middle of winter uh, in a historic house with no heating, in which case it's quite cold. Uh, so these are a, a really fascinating group of mid 17th century artifacts excavated by Gary Marshall, again in the 1990s at Chesselton House in Oxfordshire. Um, and represent a really significant hoard of glass vessels, mainly glass vessels, and a, a whole bellamine that you can see in the centre there, um, all buried under the uh, floor of the basement at Chesselton. Um, they're not all broken, some of them are broken, they're not all broken, so uh, it's interesting to think about why uh, these artefacts are here and why they've all been deposited together and they all seem to have sort of gone out of use at, at a single time. The last couple of sites um, that I wanted to look at today are, are sites that are closer to home um, for me. So um, just stopping in at Scotney Castle in Kent, which is obviously famous for the uh, late 14th century um, castle that is constructed, parts of which remain today, which you can see in the image there. In the foreground, however, is the, the, the second of the islands um, that make up the, the Scotney complex. And it was on um, the, the foreground island where we have evidence um, for an earlier um, iteration of the Scotney Castle uh, complex developed during the um, earlier years of the 14th century and pushing back uh, some time through that. Um, so those buildings have now completely uh, disappeared, but we do have archaeological evidence in the form of these artifacts that show some of the decorative elements that might have made up. Um, particularly, we think these might represent uh, the chapel on the site from the 14th century. So we've got fragments of surviving molded stone and also decorated floor tiles, which give us an, a, a little snapshot of a building that is now uh, completely disappeared. Um, Bodium Castle in Kent is another really fantastic example of a of uh, uh, obviously of a castle, it's a very, very castly castle. And there's been a huge amount of research at this site over the years to try and understand uh, the layout of the medieval building, the use of those spaces in the medieval period. On the right hand side, you can see a, a suggested reconstruction of the Southern Range, which includes, as you move from the left to the right of the image, uh, the Great Hall, which is actually a comparatively small space in this image the screens passage, the buttery and the pantry, and then the great kitchen uh, at the far end. Um, when you look at um, the finds that we have uh, from, Scotney Council, from Scotney Castle, one of the, the sort of standout items, really significant find from the site is this one, which was found uh, in the moat uh, during the excavation of the moat in the 1970s. And this is a, a late 14th century Pilgrim badge um, representing a rood, and I'm very grateful to Colin for um, permission to use his, his beautiful image of this artifact. 
there's lots of um, some questions around how did this artifact get here? Is it an example of a, one of those ritual depositions in watery spaces? What's it telling us about the beliefs of those people who occupied the castle? Is it related to the occupants or is it related to the people who were constructing the castle during the late 14th century? Um, lots of questions raised by one uh, sort of tiny, tiny image. We do know that there was, um, like at Scotney Castle, there was a chapel uh, within the medieval castle at Bodium. So, Devotion played a part in daily life, and it's it's really fascinating to think about how this artifact might link in uh, with that. So this is uh, what the interior of Scotney Castle looks like uh, today. So I wanted to finish this talk by just reflecting on um, the sort of time depth of the houses that, that we look at um, as part of our work as National Trust archaeologists. Um, Scotney Castle, for example, is very much uh, a shell um, as we see it today. So none of the uh, roofs survive of the main uh, sort of ranges, and, and it does require a certain amount of imagination to, to people the space and to kind of recreate uh, the medieval um, occupation within uh, this space. But of course, the, the medieval occupation of this space is hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And in the intervening time, um, the, the interior of the castle has been used for other um, purposes, uh, including this. So this is a detail of a, an 18th century view um, by Grimm. And you can see that within the interior of the castle in the 18th century, there was actually a, a cottage and a, and a market garden, well, not market garden, but a, you know, a, a garden layout. So you can see here, the occupants of the cottage um, sort of working away in their garden. Um, and we do also have artifacts at Scotney, which, uh, sorry, at Bodium, which reflect that uh, 18th century use of the space and the sort of development of um, this is a home through time. So it's been adapted, it's been changed, it's been used by different people at different times in different ways. Um, so when we're thinking about the archaeology of home, um, it's really interesting to think about how that changes over time and how uh, these, these very grand buildings can become something quite different. We're very lucky in the National Trust that we are able to look at um, buildings of all different sort of shapes and sizes and periods um, and to understand a little bit more about how people occupy spaces and something that's particularly resonant for me anyway at the moment as I speak to you uh, from my home where we've all been uh, for so much of the last year or so and I hope this has been an interesting insight uh, into the work of the National Trust uh, archaeologists. Um, so I'd like to just finish with a few acknowledgements to um, my colleagues who've um, been so generous with their information uh, from all of their work in, in all different parts of the UK uh, and to leave you with a, an image by Tom Galt um, of some archaeology, which I certainly have in my own home, and stratigraphy uh, of books by the bed. Thank you.